Chris is so fed up with lights, triggering Kijuji flashbacks, that he shoots the ever-loving shit out of his TV. Over the years, we've dealt with live-action Resident Evil projects that have been... Uh, you know what, let's not retread that ground. But there's one I remembered fondly, and finally decided to revisit after all these years. And that's the viral ad campaign for Resident Evil 5. Today I'm talking about Chris Redfield, arguably the most prominent protagonist throughout the Resident Evil series, and a specific, deeply interesting part of his life you may have never known about. I'm not gonna lie, when these viral ads first came out, these glimpses of his life made me nervous to see what was going to happen to Chris Redfield in the game. And that's because they're set after the events of the game. Chris recovered Jill and Wesker is dead. But I didn't know that at the time. Nobody did, because the feggin' game wasn't out yet. And the Chris we see in these live-action ads is broken. Thoroughly, utterly shattered by what he's gone through. And this is Chris coming back home and trying to readjust to everyday life and realizing he can't. And he probably never will, but more on that later. The first episode sees Chris being honored at a BSAA ceremony and given a medal following the Kijuju incident. And the very first words Chris speaks as he narrates this moment are heartbreaking. It's amazing how far you can get in life. Needs to know the difference between lives saved by destroying the lives of others. This is what he's thinking while watching a decorated superior giving a speech about his heroism. And right from the beginning I find that fascinating. Because we've been in his shoes. We've played as Chris in several Resident Evil games, and I think most of us consider him a hero. Even the players who don't like him or just think he's boring would probably agree with that. But he doesn't. And why is that? The first time I saw these, I didn't know. I had no idea what was going to happen in Kijuju, or what Chris would have to do to get through it. All these years later, as I started to rewatch this, at first I laughed. What the hell was so special about Kijuju? Chris had already lived through the Arclay outbreak, Rockfort Island, and other assorted canon storylines. Aside from finally killing Wesker, what was the big deal? That game was basically an 80s action movie with the occasional Lord of the Rings mountain troll and black spaghetti monster thrown in from time to time. Then I really gave it some thought. And that's the thing, we've controlled Chris in games, but we don't really know what he'd be thinking from one minute to the next. We're not really him. And then one by one, it started to hit me. What happened to Jill alone would easily be enough to break him. His most trusted partner and friend for years, with whom he had gotten through terrible situations before. He straight up thought she died sacrificing herself for him. And if that weren't already enough of a bummer, he realized a considerable span of time later that not only was she still alive, but held captive, brainwashed, and used by the very person they both despise the most, Albert Wesker. He had taken Jill and experimented on her with this device that burrowed into her chest and pumped her full of a virus that made her less human. Submissive to Wesker, but almost feral in a fight. And this happened to her because Chris failed. His ass was handed to him by Wesker, and what's worse, Chris didn't find her. He couldn't. He wasn't able to stop any of these horrible things from happening to his partner. And hell, to this very day, that is canonically the last time we have seen Jill Valentine. Last we heard anything about her, she was still being kept in quarantine by the BSAA, and unable to go back to an ordinary life. And it seems very fitting that neither can Chris. He accepts his award, and steps up to the podium to make his speech. And he can't. He's facing a massive crowd that likely reminds him of zombies or the Magini he fought in Africa. Their cameras flash in his eyes, like the muzzle flashes of weapons used by allies and enemies alike. And he looks down at his prepared speech and sees insane scribblings covering the pages. And that's it. He breaks down. And the very same superior who sang his praises is now, if you listen closely to the very end, making excuses while hurriedly ending the very public ceremony. And my favorite moment here goes to Sheva. Not because she's Sheva, but because she moves to recover Chris's loose pages, and she stops for a moment to stare at them, almost disturbed. We don't see what she sees. It's all left to the audience to interpret her reaction. Was Chris hallucinating those scribblings, or had he actually made them on those pages? We'll get back to that later. The main thing to focus on is that Chris doesn't see himself as a hero. And, in fact, he very likely sees himself as a failure. But let's move on. The second episode shows Chris on a date as they sit on a rooftop, looking forward to watching the sunrise together. And, uh, things seem to be going very well for my boy here, based on what this pretty lady is saying. I can't think of a better way to end a date than this. Who says it has to end? To me, I can't watch this one without actually physically cringing, and it's very difficult to tell if that's the intent, or if things only feel that way because of flaws in the acting or directing. To me, the weirdest moment comes when Chris grabs this camera and just gets all up in that personal space for this odd moment. It's confession time. What is that? 
<laughs> Anything you want to admit? I don't know. I'm probably guilty of something. Let's talk about it. I don't. <laughs> His date doesn't really know what to say, and things just feel super awkward and off-putting. Yeah, it's a bit rough. But things only get worse when the glare from her compact triggers another episode that he can't pull himself out of. By the time he regains his composure, she's gone, and he's left there alone as he again provides narration. Death is nothing to be proud of. And survival is sometimes worse than death. I think there's a lot that can be drawn from that statement. To me, I read it as he doesn't want to end up as a martyr for a lost cause, but surviving with all this pain and guilt is incredibly difficult. He feels trapped. Very much a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation at this point in his life. This is where I want people to remember. This was created well before Capcom basically made a meme out of Chris leading people to their deaths. He wasn't even a leader at all in RE5. He and Sheva were equal partners going against orders after a certain point. No team, just occasional assistance from people like Josh Stone. But he still saw a hell of a lot of death. Not just people he knew personally, or BSA agents just like him, but also all the innocent infected he's been forced to put down. That's heavy, Doc. Also, fun fact, I distinctly remember people on message boards wildly speculating that his date was actually Ada Wong undercover, and that this totally meant she was going to be in RE5, even though we knew this was taking place after. Yeah, sometimes fan speculation is, uh, just plain dumb. Like all of you who swore up and down that it was Billy Cohen in RE5's first trailer, not Chris. Shout out to all my optimistic homies still wanting Billy to return. Hang in there, mother lovers. Episode 3 is a fun one mostly because it features Claire. We very rarely get to see the Redfield siblings interact, so it's always welcome. The most interesting thing here is that they're running through a training course together, fully kitted out with weapons and gear, which seems to imply that, at least at this point, Capcom had also intended her to be part of the BSAA. Claire's mention of speaking to the company shrink about Chris also suggests this. So, I heard the company shrink thought... So Claire Redfield listens to shrinks now. I'm just asking how my big brother's doing, you jerk. This is obviously before they settled on the Terra save direction for her, but still, it's pretty neat to get a glimpse at what could have been. Even so, Chris shrugs off her concern and Claire doesn't really take it well. And when Claire opens fire at something off camera, Chris has another episode. The narration this time around feels a bit out of character. Why did I have to go? Why couldn't it have been someone else? It's a natural response to experiencing trauma, of course. It's just not something you'd expect to hear from Chris Redfield. But maybe that's the point. He's not himself. He's struggling and clearly losing it. And it's starting to affect his relationship with his sister. He may be a boulder-punching asshole, but you can't punch away mental illness. Hey, uh, somebody write that down real quick. Those are wise words, damn it. The next episode is the most troubling. It starts with more narration from Chris. I hope there's something waiting for me out there. He's made his way to this massive bridge on a dark, foggy night, and seems to give no second thought to climbing the side as a security camera watches. He continues. No matter how hard I try, I just can't seem to escape my memories. As he stands inches from the edge, seeming to gauge the fall, and at probably the worst possible time, he turns to see a rotating orange light that triggers another episode. By the time he gets out of it, he's sat on the concrete near his vehicle, covered in blood. And after a moment of disorientation, he finds the word Kijuju carved into his arm. So yeah, this episode features some heavy themes that I can't even go into with any depth, lest YouTube grab my channel by the throat and yeet it to the sun. But luckily, all you three-dimensional meatbags out there should see it without me pointing it out. Chris is nearly at the end of his rope, and even in his darkest moment, he's hounded by violent flashbacks and has a severely alarming self-afflicted injury. Or so I assume, but I guess the trauma fairy could have pulled a drive-by on his ass while he was seizing up. In any case, it's just sad to see such a good dude in a tough place. He's a founding member of the BSAA, and you'd assume he began that journey hoping to clean up Umbrella's mess and keep people safe. But here's the open, dirty secret of the Resident Evil universe. It's screwed. Everything. Umbrella's evil is always going to exist. Its research and creations are out there, circulating in the black market, being replicated for profit endlessly. There's no preventing outbreaks anymore. All people like Chris and Jill can do is try to help minimize the damage once they happen, and they will happen, because anyone rich enough, or with the right connections, can cause a new Raccoon City incident on a whim, 
And I'm sure Chris realizes that. I mean, look at him. That's somebody who feels hopeless. And unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna change. This last episode leaves us with that impression. Before getting into the meat of it, I'll say that what we'll see here is Sheva coming to get Chris because they have new orders. But listen to this opening narration. You can hear the frustration, most of all, in his choice of words. There are some things you can't run from, and there are some things that never die. The human brain is a complicated bitch. Once an image is burned in, it's scarred there forever. But now let's take a look at where Chris is living. There's a couple of nice things to say about it. He's got a small African statue collection, which makes sense. He and Sheva sure as shit plundered Kijuju on their little adventure. I personally think it's a nice touch that he owns a typewriter. And he's got a nice little fish friend. Look at the little guy doing, I don't know, fish things, I guess. The fuck does a fish do? But holy shit, look at this place. He's gone full Kevin Spacey in 7, and you never go full Kevin Spacey in 7. You don't really want to be Kevin Spacey adjacent, let alone Kevin Spacey in 7. Even K-Pax would be more acceptable than that. I'm probably like one of five people who remember that movie, and I fully recommend it. But uh, let's also point out that Chris is so fed up with lights triggering Kijuji flashbacks that he shoots the ever-loving shit out of his TV and still has one final episode. He's full-on drowning himself in his bathtub before Sheva pulls him out of it. And she doesn't really think twice about it. Just hands him a towel and tells him they have a new mission. And this is by far the most telling thing about Chris's character. We've seen him struggling to live for several episodes now, but the second there's a crisis, he jumps into action gears up, grabs a considerable collection of guns, and even starts rushing Sheva. Now remember when I mentioned Chris's speech in the first episode and how we didn't see what Sheva sees on the pages? There was a similar moment with Claire, where Chris is staring at Kijuju graffiti on the wall, but we never quite see her see it, so we don't know if it's real. But as Sheva walks through Chris's place, we see her reaction to the way Chris redecorated. Full Kevin Spacey in 7. My boy has problems, and he's not addressing them. He's living mission to mission, avoiding his trauma, and it's changing him. Now, have I looked a little too deeply into something that amounts to a few minutes of commercials? Ah, hell yeah, of course. But the mental illness we see taking hold of Chris in these shorts is followed up on by Capcom. In RE6, Chris is bogged down with PTSD and survivor's guilt, becoming excessively aggressive and oftentimes irrational. And while he's a bit more chill in RE7 and his solo DLC... How do I stop it? You need to find a way to shut down the server. There may be some transformer relays you can- Okay, that worked. Gonna be some pissed computer techs up here, but- From your river. In Village, we again see him being entirely too aggressive and making bad decisions in the heat of the moment. Though a lot of that is from him just trying to prevent more collateral damage. Where is he? Chris! What have you done? He's gone! I tried. He stayed so we could all escape. I'm sorry. So while these ads may not necessarily be canon, though I'd argue they could very well be, the ideas introduced here are being continued to this day. So all you people hating Chris Redfield for being boring, I don't know what to tell you. You're just flat out wrong. For all the memes about boulder punching, Chris Redfield is the most humanized character in this series. And I hope Capcom does him justice when they conclude his story. Hashtag justice for Chris. I'm baffled, and hope to see you all next time. Bye.